Imagine a trio that single-handedly shifted the American music scene back to its roots, inspiring legends like Paul Simon and David Crosby. You've probably never heard of them until now. 20. The Kingston Trio What if I told you that not every legendary trio from the 60s played blues or psychedelic rock? Some laid the foundation for something entirely different. Not all legendary trios of the 60s were blues or psychedelic rock. Some dwelled more in the realm of folk and contributed to the rebirth of folk, turning it into folk rock in the 60s while collecting multiple awards. The Kingston Trio was formed in San Francisco by junior high school students who, from learning to play ukulele and guitar together, recorded 19 albums and landed a record number of hits and record sales, shifting American pop music again to its roots. The Kingston Trio might not be a power trio with drums and electric guitars, yet the harmony vocals, banjo, and guitar work laid a foundation for popular country and folk music. Massive names like Paul Simon, Lindsey Buckingham, and David Crosby list them as some of the top influences. Arguably, the entire singer-songwriter movement of the 60s rode on the trio's wave. Uh, not long ago, three California college men chipped in to make their own record of a song called Tom Dooley. And in a very few short weeks, it has zoomed up the popularity polls to the number one spot and you can hear it in this great new album of theirs and here they are ladies and gentlemen in person to do it first now the sensational kingston trio <laughs> Nineteen, The Mothers Before the Mothers of Invention took the world by storm, there was a little-known trio that showcased Frank Zappa at his closest to pure rock and roll. The Mothers of Invention, led by the eccentric genius of Frank Zappa, are known to be a big band that scanned through hundreds of members over the years. Yet not many know while the Mothers were forming, Zapp was gigging locally in LA with a power trio called The Mothers to support his lifestyle of all-day experimenting in the studio. This was when Zappa was at the closest to rock and roll as he ever got, shredding guitars and heavy tunes but occasionally picking up odd instruments and dwelling into soundscapes. Only little materials remain from the mothers, but there's some gold to be found, especially if you're a Zappa fan. Unfortunately, there are only a few live recordings of this band, as Frank focused on the mothers on the recording side. It Eighteen, Cream. Ever wondered what it would be like if three of the most talented musicians of their time came together, even though they couldn't stand each other? Well, here's what happened. Cream was the cream of the crop, and the members knew it. Formed in the UK in 1966, Cream consisted of guitarist singer Eric Clapton, bassist singer harmonica player Jack Bruce, and drummer Ginger Baker. Blues guitarist Clapton assembled the triad even after he discovered that Bruce and Baker essentially hated each other. Cream's first album was the classic Fresh Cream, which still sounds ass-kicking good. Featured on the album was one of Rock's first tunes highlighting a drum solo, Toad, which showed Baker's prowess as a frenetic jazz-influenced drummer. In those days, everybody thought Baker was a speed freak because he played so fast. Their second album, Disraeli Gears, highlighted Cream's ability to produce marketable singles such as Sunshine of Your Love, Strange Brew, and Tales of Brave Ulysses. When touring in the tradition of bands such as The Grateful Dead, Cream became known for its long improvisational versions of such songs as Spoonful, NSU, and Sweet Wine. Clapton once stated that he still has hearing damage from the loudness with which the band played during those days. Cream's third album, Wheels of Fire, a double album set, exemplified the triumvirate's versatility, 
particularly Bruce's classical orientation on songs such as Passing the Time, Those Were the Days, and Pressed Rat and Warthog. Also, Clapton's live version of Robert Johnson's blues standard Crossroads has become a blues rock staple. Interestingly, Clapton considers himself to be, above all else, a blues guitarist. Cream tossed out one more album, essentially a dried out bone called Goodbye, which featured a passably good concert version of I'm So Glad and Badge, a tune presaging Clapton's subsequent descent into pop mania. Cream reunited for a set in 1993 and then four sets in 2005. But plans for another reunion are not in the works. Even though Cream lasted for only two years, the technical virtuosity of its members and their critical acclaim and popularity are without peer in the world of rock and roll. Seventeen. Peter, Paul, and Mary. They were more than just musicians, they were activists whose harmonies and lyrics brought about change. This trio isn't just a part of music history, they helped shape it. The iconic American folk trio Peter, Paul, and Mary, Peter Yarrow, Paul Stuckey, and Mary Travers, earned their place in history with their beautiful harmonies, thought-provoking lyrics, and evocative songwriting. As trailblazers in the 1960s folk revival movement, they brought social consciousness and activism to the forefront of popular music. Their timeless songs and enduring message of peace and love have solidified their place as one of the most beloved and important rock trios ever. It's impossible to write the history of 1960s folk rock without including Peter, Paul, and Mary. The trio's intricate harmonies and poetic lyrics made them an immediate success. Their 1962 self-titled debut album went double platinum thanks to hits like Lemon Tree and If I Had a Hammer, The Hammer Song. The group continued churning out notable tunes throughout the decade including Puff the Magic Dragon, Leaving on a Jet Plane, and one of the 60's defining songs, Blowin' in the Wind. Together, Peter Yarrow, Paul Stuckey, and Mary Travers not only entertained listeners, but also opened their minds to such important topics as the civil rights and anti-war movements. The trio broke up in 1970 as each member pursued a solo career. They reunited a handful of times over the years before staging an official reunion tour in 1978. Peter, Paul, and Mary got back together permanently in 1981 and stayed that way through Travers' death in 2009. 16. Genesis This trio's beginnings were humble, but they went on to become one of the most influential progressive rock bands of all time. And it all started with a group of schoolmates. Founded in 1967 by schoolmates at the Charterhouse Public School, Genesis was first known for their songwriting talents and Gabriel's uniquely theatrical onstage performances. After their lineup stabilized with the addition of drummer Collins and guitarist Hackett in 1970, the group developed a style that featured heavy synthesizers and arrangements emphasizing group performance over the individual pyrotechnics favored by many progressive rock groups. The band developed a dedicated following in the early 1970s. After the release of their acclaimed The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, 1974, Gabriel left to pursue a solo career. With Collins performing lead vocals, the band slowly developed a more mainstream sound marked by the successful albums Duke, 1980, Abacab, 1981, and Invisible Touch, 1986, and scored a host of hit singles. Despite many successful side projects, most notably Rutherford's pop combo Mike and the Mechanics and the departure of Collins in 1995, the band continued to record with the 1997 release Calling All Stations. This proved to be the group's final studio album, however, as the 2007 reunion tour with Collins back as lead vocalist did not lead to any new material. Genesis was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2010. 
15, The James Gang. Before joining one of the biggest rock bands in the world, Joe Walsh was part of a trio that brought American blues to the forefront of rock music. Before joining the Eagles, Joe Walsh was already releasing legendary songs like Funk No. 49 along with bassist Tom Chris and Jim Fox on drums. The James Gang soaked their feet in psychedelic rock but kept on their folky blues and southern roots, adding the American touch to what the Brits brought. The British invasion inspired drummer Fox to hunt for members and eventually, after many lineup changes, recruit the young Joe Walsh, who knocked on his door asking to be the new guitar player. The James Gang might have roots in the 60s, but some success would come to them in the early 70s when they shared stages with Led Zeppelin and The Who. Still, never landing a hit in six albums eventually led each member to go their own way. For a time, it looked as though the James Gang was destined to carry the Power Trio torch first fired up by Cream in the Jimi Hendrix experience. Your album, the band's 1969 debut, saw drummer Jim Fox, bassist Tom Chris, and guitarist singer Joe Walsh establish a riff-driven sound that earned praise from the likes of Pete Townsend. With Dale Peters replacing Chris, the trio went on to record two more classic LPs, Rides Again and Thirds, before Walsh exited to launch his solo career. Thanks largely to Walsh's distinctive style, tracks like Funk No. 49 and Walk Away rank among classic rock's most instantly recognizable songs. James Gang forged on for several years without Walsh, but nothing they produced afterwards matched the thrill of the new evident on those first three records. Fourteen, the big three. Imagine being in the same rehearsal space as the Beatles with the same management, but never quite making it to their level of fame. That's the story of the big three. The big three are the band that could have become the Beatles. They shared the same rehearsal space and management and were offered some of the same stage, yet they only produced minor hits on the international scene. Even though they never reached the acclaimed success of their Liverpool peers, the Big Three were a significant part of the Merseybeat sound, a blend of rock, folk, and blues styles that began in Liverpool and was among the progenitors of garage and psychedelic rock. Sadly, the band couldn't hold up together, and even the extraordinary Epstein, who rose the Beatles to fame, couldn't find the proper way to break them through. Thirteen, Os Mutantes. While the world watched the Beatles, a revolutionary trio was making waves in Brazil with their own psychedelic sound, defying government censorship and angry crowds. While the Beatles spread their music around the Northern Hemisphere, a dissident trio created their own psychedelic rock style in Brazil, influenced by the Tropicalia movement. Os Mutantes deserve a special mention as, unlike their US or UK counterparts, they recorded and released their music under the threat of a strict government regime. This didn't stop the two Baptista brothers and singer Rita Lee from participating in national song festivals and even performing under persistent pressure from angry crowds and officials. A major credit also goes to their album's production quality and songwriting. Their legendary self-titled album could very well have been produced in Abbey Road and still would sound just as experimental and solid. Twelve, the Ronettes. They were one of the few girl groups to open for both the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. But what made the Ronettes unforgettable was their unique sound. The Ronettes, made up of Veronica Bennett, her older sister Estelle, and their cousin Nedra Talley, hold a unique place in history. In 1964, the year their only album was released, the Rolling Stones served as the trio's opener during a tour of the UK. Two years later, the Ronettes opened for the Beatles. These weren't the only rock legends the women rubbed elbows with. 
The Ronettes became close friends with Jimi Hendrix and are featured on the Guitar Grade's posthumous album, Rainbow Bridge. Of course, all of this is nice trivia, but it only matters because the Ronettes happen to be an incredible group in their own right. Even with just one studio LP on their resume, the trio landed nine songs on the Billboard Hot 100. Six of those, including Be My Baby, Baby I Love You, and Walking in the Rain, became top 40 hits. Internal disputes kept their time together short, but their distinctive sound was unforgettable. The Ronettes were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2007. Eleven, Three Dog Night. Three vocalists, one band, and a string of hits that defined the late 60s. Let's take a look at how Three Dog Night took over the charts. This American rock trio featuring vocalists Danny Hutton, Chuck Negron, and Corey Wells found success in the late 60s and early 70s with their tight harmonies and a knack for selecting strong material from outside songwriters. They scored a string of massive hits including Joy to the World and Mama Told Me Not to Come, which showcased their versatility and ability to put a unique spin on each song. While perhaps not as well known today, their impressive chart success and memorable tunes earned them a rightful place among the best musical trios. Danny Hutton, Corey Wells, and Chuck Negron, all vocalists, formed the American band Three Dog Night in 1967. Since the original band was a trio, singing with a variety of backup musicians, they are included in this list, although other band members were added as backup through the years. Between 1969 and 1975, Three Dog Night had 21 top 40 Billboard hits, including such memorable songs as An Old Fashioned Love Song, Celebrate, Joy to the World, Mama Told Me Not to Come, and Never Been to Spain. Three Dog Night was inducted into the Vocal Group Hall of Fame in 2000. Blue Cheer They were loud, they were raw, and some say they invented heavy metal before anyone else even thought about it. This is the story of Blue Cheer. Before anyone else started it, at a time when even Black Sabbath was not around, Blue Cheer was heavier than anyone, arguably inventing heavy metal before Sabbath made it famous. The San Francisco trio was formed in the image of the Hendrix experience, opting for fewer members but dialing down on power, blending blues, psychedelic, and fuzzed guitars up to the point when it got far beyond what you'd expect of the 60s. Whether they invented metal or not, it's for you to judge after listening to their proto-metal debut album, Vincibu Eruptum, and especially the song Summertime Blues. Blue Cheer underwent countless restructurings in personnel, but their late 60s groundbreaking work was generally forged as a trio. Emerging from San Francisco's psychedelic scene, founding members Dickie Peterson, Paul Whaley, and Lee Stevens helped create a template for the thunderous primal sound later christened Heavy Metal. Indeed, more than one rock historian has cited the band's volcanic 1968 cover of Eddie Cochran's Summertime Blues as heavy metal's ground zero. No less an expert than The Doors' Jim Morrison once described Blue Cheer as the single most powerful band I've ever seen. Nine, Rush. Critics may not have loved them, but fans never left their side. This is the trio that turned progressive rock into an epic journey spanning nearly 50 years. While rarely embraced by critics, it took over 40 years for the band to make the cover of Rolling Stone, and not producing music that courted traditional radio, Rush cemented itself as a progressive rock icon with its fourth album, 1976's 2112, and Never Let Go peaking in mainstream popularity with 1981's Moving Pictures and its follow-up, Signals, in 1982. Throughout its four-decade run, the band never lost its fan base. 
Indeed, the baton has been passed from generation to generation of fans, and the Rush devotees never left the band's side through whatever stylistic and arrangement changes the band embarked upon, including the growing inclusion of synthesizers as part of the band's sound. Individually, each member is regarded as one of the best at what he does. Alex Lifeson guitar, Deddy Lee bass synths vocals, and Neil Peart drums. And collectively, the band's body of work spans nearly 50 years and 20 studio albums, as well as a hefty number of live releases. Famously listed among the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame snubs for many years, the band was inducted in 2013, 15 years after they were eligible. The band has halted touring due to the physical toll a life of performing has taken on Pert in particular, but the band insists there is no talk of retirement and promises more to come. Eight, Grand Funk Railroad. They were called the loudest rock and roll band in the world and were pioneers of hard rock in America. This is how Grand Funk Railroad carved their legacy. What started as a five-piece from Michigan dialed down to its core of three members, a quintessential power trio that dared to step on stage and start the first glimpses of hard rock in the U.S. GFR started their career near the end of the 60s, but it was enough to change the music scene. What critics considered dumb music, others considered the loudest rock and roll band in the world and followed them into their massive shows. You could arguably call GFR the prototypal arena rock band. Farner's screaming blues vocals and guitar style were reminiscent of Clapton and Bruce and their UK counterpart Cream. The US trio though was harder, faster, and more intense than anything the British invasion had brought. A genuine, classic, pure rock band. Seven, the Supremes. Motown's biggest stars weren't just a vocal group, they were a cultural force. From chart-topping hits to breaking barriers, the Supremes set the standard for success in the 60s. One of the most legendary record labels in music history was Motown. And who was the most successful artist Motown ever had? The Supremes. With the incomparable Diana Ross leading the way, the vocal trio, which also included Florence Ballard and Mary Wilson, achieved worldwide fame in the 60s. Their list of hits is a mile long with Where Did Our Love Go, Baby Love, Come See About Me, and Stop In The Name Of Love among the 12 songs the Supremes landed at number one. Several of their chart records remain today, decades after their last release. The group's lineup shifted over the years, most notably when Ross exited to launch her solo career in 1970. Still, even if you just limit yourself only to material released prior to her departure, the Supremes rank among the most popular acts ever recorded. Six, ZZ Top. Three men, Texas blues, and some of the most iconic beards in rock history. Let's get into how ZZ Top rocked the world with their unique sound. Billy Gibbons joined with Frank Beard and Dusty Hill in 1969 to form the Texas Southern Blues rock band known as ZZ Top. With hits like LaGrange, Legs, and Sharp Dressed Man, ZZ Top rocked Texas, the USA, and beyond. By the mid 80s, ZZ Top was known around the world. ZZ Top has won numerous awards and honors, including multiple video music awards, induction into Hollywood's Rock Walk of Fame, induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and being named official heroes of the state of Texas. ZZ Top has six number one singles on the mainstream rock chart, has earned four gold album certifications, three platinum album certifications, two multiple platinum album certifications, and one diamond album certification with sales of over 10 million records. ZZ Top is truly a legendary rock trio. Five. 
five, Rory Gallagher's taste. He was one of the greatest guitarists you've probably never heard of. Rory Gallagher's blues rock trio Taste brought fiery performances and unforgettable riffs. Arguably the greatest blues guitarist from Ireland and one of the most influential players ever, Gallagher started his performing career with the blues rock trio Taste, which infused Gallagher's virtuosity with touches of jazz and psychedelic. What started as a local band, Taste gained recognition in the UK when they opened for Cream's farewell concert and toured the USA and Canada getting to play along with Hendrix on the Isle of Wight show, arguably their most famous performance that luckily got all caught on camera. Gallagher soon left the band he created, leaving space for another member to join while his solo career reached up to 30 million records sold worldwide. He is still referred to as the greatest guitarist you've never heard of. Four, The Nice. Before Emerson, Lake and Palmer, there was The Nice, a band that redefined the live rock show with wild performances and genre bending music. Here's how it all started. The Nice were an English progressive rock band active in the late 1960s. They blended rock, jazz, and classical music and were keyboardist Keith Emerson's first commercially successful band. The group was formed in 1967 by Emerson, Lee Jackson, David O. List, and Ian Haig to back soul singer P.P. Arnold. After replacing Haig with Brian Davison, the group set out on their own, quickly developing a strong live following. The group's stage performances featured Emerson's Hammond organ showmanship and abuse of the instrument. Their compositions included radical rearrangements of classical music themes and Bob Dylan songs. The band achieved commercial success with an instrumental rearrangement of Leonard Bernstein's America, following which O'List left the group. The remaining members carried on as a trio, releasing several albums before Emerson left the band in early 1970 in order to form Emerson, Lake & Palmer. The group briefly reformed in 2002 for a series of concerts. Three, Bee Gees. They started as a rock band but reinvented themselves as disco legends. With over 200 million albums sold, the Bee Gees were masters of their craft. True musical chameleons, the Bee Gees' impact on popular music cannot be overstated. The trio, made up of Barry, Robin, and Maurice Gibb, started their musical career as a rock act, even opening for Chubby Checker during his 1962 tour of Australia. Slowly, the Bee Gees began developing their style, landing a trio of pop hits on 1967's Bee Gees First. Success would come quickly from there, as the trio churned out further hits throughout the decade. Then, in the 70s, things reached another level. The Bee Gees evolved once more, this time to embrace the disco phenomenon. With tunes like You Should Be Dancing, Jive Talkin', and the ubiquitous Stayin' Alive, the group became one of the biggest acts of the era. Even as the inevitable backlash against disco arrived, the Bee Gees just kept selling records. In a career spanning more than 50 years, it's estimated they sold more than 200 million albums worldwide, ranking them among the most popular artists in history. Two, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Three men, three voices, and one unforgettable sound. Crosby, Stills, and Nash defined a generation with their music and activism. Here's the story of this iconic trio. Before Canadian singer-songwriter Neil Young joined in, Crosby, Stills, and Nash was a three-man act. This began in 1968 in California after David Crosby, Stephen Stills, and Graham Nash realized they shared a musical chemistry that couldn't be ignored. This came after all three men were no longer part of the bands they previously belonged to. Crosby was asked to leave the Birds, which he did, and Nash left his group, The Hollies. Buffalo Springfield was the band Stills belonged to before it officially disbanded. 
As a trio, the men signed a recording contract with Atlantic Records in 1969 before releasing Crosby, Stills & Nash as their first album that same year. It released two hit singles, first with Sweet, Judy Blue Eyes, then Marrakesh Express. Both singles became hits on the US Billboard Hot 100 with the first peaking at number 21 and the second peaking as high as number 28. Young's involvement with Crosby, Stills & Nash began when the men were preparing to go on a concert tour. It would be at this time the three-man act increased its full-time roster to four. While at the infamous Woodstock Festival, it was strictly Crosby, Stills & Nash performing the first six songs before Young would join in for the rest. Crosby, Stills & Nash were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1997 as a trio act. In addition to this achievement, Crosby was inducted as a member of the Birds while Nash experienced the same for the Hollies. Stills, along with Young, were inducted as Buffalo Springfield the same year Crosby, Stills and Nash were. Stills had the good fortune to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame twice in one year. Going into May 1969, Crosby, Stills & Nash released the trio's self-titled album and it became a big hit on the US Billboard 200 as it peaked as high as number 6. It went on to become certified four times with the RIAA. Also in the lineup at the same time was a drummer named Dallas Taylor. For the most part, the debut album featured Stills performing the lead guitar, bass, and keyboards, while Crosby and Nash handled the rhythm and acoustics. What Crosby, Stills, and Nash became was a cultural icon that served as one of the biggest influencers of American culture as the end of the 1960s gave way to the start of the 1970s. Even after the roster grew to four men after Neil Young joined in, the act was still widely recognized as Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Also a key influencer was another Canadian singer-songwriter, Joni Mitchell. At one time, she was involved with David Crosby, and it was she who introduced Crosby and Young to each other. When she met Graham Nash, these two formed a relationship in 1968 that would last for two years. Although the romance was short and sweet, this was a time when Mitchell and Nash produced some of their best work as musicians. As a result, Crosby, Stills & Nash also benefited and this showed in the trio's first album. Lady of the Island was a song Graham Nash wrote that had Joni Mitchell as the source of his inspiration. Teach your children well, cause their father's hell. One. The Jimi Hendrix Experience No band embodied the spirit of the 60s quite like the Jimi Hendrix Experience, a power trio that changed the course of rock history in just three short years. Jimi Hendrix, the most influential guitarist of all time, spearheaded the archetypal power trio band. The experience only lasted three years and released the same number of studio albums. Yet, it was among the first to evolve blues into rock, becoming the central figure of the psychedelic movement. The band was formed by the Animals' ex-bassist Chaz Chandler, who first spotted Hendrix in the US, convinced him to move to London to launch his career, signed his record deal, and found two other monster players to back him on stage. They rode the wave of the psychedelic movement and jumped the British invasion wagon led by Jimmy's revolutionary guitar work. Having become the highest paid rock musician in the world at only 26, Hendrix eventually went for a solo career and sadly passed away only one year later. To this day, their records inspire generations of rock musicians, are a staple of rock radios worldwide, and a cornerstone of pop culture. Simply put, the Jimi Hendrix experience expanded the possibilities for electric guitar-based rock beyond anyone's wildest dreams. Tethered to drummer Mitch Mitchell's jazz-flavored grooves and bassist Noel Redding's anchoring bass lines, Hendrix obliterated the line between lead and rhythm guitar, crafting six-string arrangements that were near orchestral. Tracks such as Purple Haze, Hey Joe, and The Wind Cries Mary framed traditional blues in otherworldly textures. At the time of his death, Hendrix was looking to expand his music and his band format, but the image of him on stage flanked by just two sidemen remains indelible. Give it up. 
Thanks for watching. If you love diving into the history of these forgotten trios, make sure to check out our other videos for more deep dives into music history. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you never miss an update. See you in the next one!